figures. And this occurs when we are horizontal. And so, yes, we will bring up acid. Now, it doesn't have to be liquid, but it can be fume. It's still acid. Depending on the length of the soft palate determines whether we get a post-nasal drip or we get petiolism. So if we've got a long soft palate, the fumes are going to go straight up the back of the nose. The nose is going to go, shit, I don't like this stuff. Let's make secretions to wall it off. And now we have a post-nasal drip. If we've got a small soft palate, the fumes come into the mouth, and the mouth goes, I don't like this stuff, and now we're going to make more saliva to get rid of that. And that's petiolism. So this is why we'll see erosion in the bruxes. So those earlier photos that I showed you with the breakdown at the gum line of the teeth, that's just not bruxing. That's stress coupled with dryness, coupled with acid, heat, fuel and oxygen. That's my fire. That's my decay. It's the triad. You need all three things for decay. Um, I think recurrent tonsillitis is another thing you need to look at. An unexplained cough, a kid that's... <coughs> in his chair and he just doesn't want you in there. That's acid. All right? He's off to a paediatric ear, nose and throat and look to see if you can see an inflamed uvula. Red uvula in kids. Um, metabolic compensations. These kids don't grow. They don't thrive. They're often small. Compare them with their brother. Got the 10-year-old boys here and he's got the 8-year brother and he's, you know, uh, 10 inches taller. A greater susceptibility to viral infections. And this all makes sense because we have reduced immunity. If we're low in oxygen, we have reduced resistance. So a lot of these patients will complain of finger and toe problems. I always look at their fingers, I always look at their toes. The bloke that says, mate, I've got this toe problem, mate, it just won't heal up. I'm going right. Understand? And then the neurocognitive. This is very, very important. I put this in for Romola. But we need to understand that when we've got behavioural issues, don't just wipe the kid off as being disruptive and a problem. This kid has got a problem, and it might be something as simple as not getting enough oxygen in his sleep. And the problems are often paradoxical. We're in an adult, not getting enough sleep makes us irritable, grumpy, and those kids flat, whatever. Kids can actually be paradoxically hyperactive. It doesn't sound like it might make sense, but a kid you can't get sit in chair, just can't keep still, it's behaviourally quite difficult, quite hyperactive. If they're bruxing, I think sleep, they're knackered, and it's a, it's a paradoxical effect. Yeah, that's a good point. Quite interesting. Absolutely. So, venous pooling, this was actually taken on an adult. I didn't have a good one. Venous pooling is not something you can easily pick up. Uh, but venous pooling, we get this because in our sleep, our core blood pressure rises. So if we take the blood pressure, a normal situation is when you go to bed, your blood pressure is higher than what it is when you wake in the morning. When we've got sleep to, to sleep disorder of breathing, it's the reverse. So what happens with uh, the mouth breathing is the body tries to compensate, the heart starts to work over, uh, overload, the core blood pressure increases, but we're horizontal, we're asleep. So where does the blood go? It just goes straight to the head. The problem is then we wake up, except Dr. Nolder, right? He doesn't wake up. And now gravity plays its role. And it takes a long time for that blood to drain out of our head. And really, the path of least resistance is the infra infraorbital vein. It goes out underneath the eyes. But then it just pulls and bags. So when we get the venous pooling, this too is a little kid who's got a blocked carburetor nine times. Or anemia. Or some sort of medical problem that is putting their body under a lot of physical or psychological stress. It's not just airway. Three things, right? Um, with adults, the additional things, high cholesterol, dysrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, low blood pressure is upper airway resistance syndrome, high blood pressure is obstructive sleep apnea. Oh, I don't have that, I have, uh, I have low blood pressure, that's not me. Well, it's still sleep disorder breathing. In fact, your upper airway resistance might put you at greater morbidity in the longer term uh, as opposed to an acute problem with OSA now. Another thing, uh, so it puts load on the heart, Raynard's phenomenon, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, polycythemia, right? The body recognises that it needs more oxygen, so it's going, shit, how can I do this? Let's make more, red blood, more red, red blood cells. 
So we make more red blood cells, but what happens? We block up our arteries. And then what happens? We have a stroke. And I had a patient who had one of those today, had a TIA. And she's been on CPAP for about three months. Uh, she's only just started. She had a very simple procedure done on the top tooth. Um, she left, she was fine. She left the practice, she was driving home, and one side of her body went numb. She was able to get to her husband's work, which was about 10 minutes away. Her husband drove her back to me, saying, mate, what have you done to her? And what are the three things for stroke? How do you know if someone's had a stroke? And they're conscious. Three things. Raise your hands, say your name and smile. She couldn't do either three, so she had a transient ischemic attack. That's how it happens. So when you get complications in practice, it's only because the same reason why they're in the chair. It's all the same. Uh, the metabolic things. The thing I want you to appreciate here is impotence in males. It's something they don't like to talk about, which is fair enough, but often just go by their medications. If you see Cialis or you see testosterone, that's a red flag. And I'll show you a case shortly. Neurocognitive compensations. Again, we have depression, anxiety and dementia. Uh, <coughs> elevated workplace and motor vehicle. Eyes. Another thing. Uh, one other thing I, I think was there, probably in the previous slide. Um, yes, eclampsia and other adverse pregnancy outcomes in women. That's a good one. All right, all this starting to come to the surface now. Who would have asked a female patient any history of eclampsia or preeclampsia when you had kids? Wouldn't do that. So, now we're going into uh, sweets. That was main course. So I haven't lost you any? No questions? Two max? Or I'll move on. Right. So now... This is where you start to take some stuff home, or at least I'd like to see you take some stuff home. Because I've wasted my time tonight if you don't walk away with this last segment. Where you start, and I've put that on your table, and I don't care what you do with it. Make a paper plane out of it, it's your loss. But if you walk away with that medical history, I have another one for kids. Where you start is the way you collect data from your patients. And that old medical history, toss it in the bin. Now a lot of the patients are going to say, oh, what is this? But automatically you're different from the bloke down the road. And now you're not competing on price alone. You have a different approach to 99% of dentists out there. And that includes specialists. Unfortunately, the medical history from specialists are less than that old thing there. You need to have emphasis on airway. So before you look in the mouth, look at them side on. Look for the kink neck, look for the kyphosis, look up their nose, look at the shape of their nose. Right? Sleep questionnaires are something that I use routinely for adults. They're a tool, they're a screener but they're not definitive. I could have a low EP worth and have a, have a severe OSA patient and I can have a really high EP worth and have no SA, no SA. I could have periodic limb movement. So periodic limb movement can cause arousals, but it's got nothing to do with uh, anything else. The OPG for all patients, you start with an OPG. Don't start bite wing, don't start periapical, get that big screen. And if you're worried about the cost, don't charge them for an intraoral. Just say, look, oh, I want this, and if I need any others, I won't charge you. Oh, okay. But then the patient can visualise what you visualise. So the OPG becomes a very good tool. We need to look at the shape of their nose and their apertures. We've got to look for uh, profile, transverse relationships, small upper jaw. Then you jump into the mouth. So the first 10 minutes is outside the mouth, looking up their nose. They think you're strange. They all go P And then I put the mirror right there, and they think you're weird. But in a quirky way, they think, you know what, I like you, because you're very different to the other people. <coughs> now, the kids say banana. If they go, mana, well, 
that tells me I've got something bad up the back. If they can't say, ah, then the soft palate can't elevate, that tells me I've got something bad up the back. You can check your joints, understand, don't stop at the teeth. So, you know, you've got to record functional ranges. Every patient I see, I have a ruler on the bracket and I record their vertical opening. First thing I do, you've got to do it. Record their vertical opening. More than 40, you're fine, okay? Um, palpate the muscles, feel the jaw joints. Don't worry about clicks, don't worry about noises. The other thing I want you to focus on is timing of dental complications. So once I've got that OPG, I then say, right, when did you have that molar upstairs, outstairs on the right? Oh, about three years ago. And when did you have the root treatment out, uh, upstairs on the left? Oh, about the same time. So now I know I'm going to go back three years before that. So I say, right, six years ago, I've gone to their medical history, and lo and behold, they were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes five years ago. They had a transient ischemic attack six years ago, and their wife left them five and a half years ago. They think you're pretty special when you make that connection, I can assure you. I haven't shown them any ceramic, I've shown them no veneers, I've shown them no nothing. But look at timing, it's very important. And look for compensations that are indicative of mouth breathing. So as Professor Alves said, the nose is the carburetor for the body. Start looking at noses. Don't start looking at teeth, initially. Look for subtle signs on OPGs that might be indicative of upper airway resistance. Look for your pattern of dental breakdown that's suggestive of bruxes or unstable bruxes. Screen your patients from a functional point of view. You have an obligation to do that. The mouth breathers invariably have some level of TMD. But it doesn't mean we treat it. But we need to screen and record it. So when it comes to triage, how am I going to handle these people? I got them in the chair, I found out they got this problem. What am I going to do with all this information? Well, I work on threes. So where I start with kids, I want hard and soft tissue findings that are consistent with mouth breathing. That's the first thing. So it might be a bit of decay, it might be a bit of grinding, it might be a bit of erosion, it might be uh, cheek biting and mucus seals, whatever. It might be thumb sucking in a kid. The thumb suckers are the mouth breathers, right? Um, then we look for the dental compensations that are consistent with mouth breathing, which I've gone over. Then you look at your medical profile that might be suggestive of sleep disordered breathing. Mum, Dad, does your kid snore at night? Oh, too right. Sometimes I get them to do a little iPhone study. Well, next time you come in, can you just take a little snippet with your iPhone, get their shirt up, or just put them to bed without a shirt? And when they're out to it, just pull the sheet down and just, when they're making a bit of noise, let's have a look. And what we're looking for is what's called paradoxical breathing, which is indicative of sleep disorder breathing and sleep apnea. Uh, an ENOs and throat doctor will pick that up straight away and they'll love you for it. And a mother will love you, really love you, if you can solve their kid's bedwetting. Let alone their ADH or their hyperactivity disorders, right? Digit sucking, bed wetting, all these sorts of things, learning issues. It's very, very important. You're the gatekeeper here. But we're looking at less than five years of age. The ear, nose and throat doctors say, you know what, for me to have a real dent in this, I need to see him by six. So now when mum says, oh, what time should we get our kids' teeth checked? I say, you know what, three is good, but you know what, I don't want to look in their mouth. I just want you to come in here and just let me look at his face and just fill out that medical history for me. I don't want to look at his teeth. Good luck if you can. He doesn't want me in there anyway, if he's a mouth breather, right? And the kid will go, ah, well, he's not a mouth breather. Then, at that point, I've got my three red flags. What am I going to do with the patient? Straight off, with a kid, I will refer them to an ear, nose and throat doctor, a paediatric ENT. Now, I don't need to refer the patient to the GP to get a referral. I can refer straight to an ENT. As dentists, we can, and they'll get a Medicare. I wasn't aware of this. I've only found that out in the last week. Yes? Can you describe what paradoxical... Yeah, it just means the chest and the tummy go in and out like this. It's all wrong. It's all skew whiff with their breathing patterns. All right? Now, 
The reason why I go with an ENT referral is because we understand that a lot of these paediatric patients get very successful outcomes with surgery, which is a little bit opposite for adults. Again, this is where the management and assessment is different. We can't compare apples with apples. So with kids, Professor McIntosh is of the opinion, and he's done some studies to show that he believes he can get about an 80 to 90% success rate with an adenotonsillectomy if it's performed under six years of age. Okay, that improves their breathing, but of course then we've got the hangover. The hangover is the dental compensations left behind. We've now got a narrow maxilla. We might have a slightly retrusive mandible, so yes, we might need some growth modification to mop it up. But what we don't do is we don't listen to the orthodontists. And the orthodontists say, ah, don't need to see an ENT, send them over to me. I need to see them by seven. And at seven years of age, I'm going to do a bit of expansion. And there's studies to show that when we expand, we can improve uh, pates of the upper airway. Uh, and, you know, things are going to get a lot better. And in my hands, a lot of these patients then don't need to have uh, surgery. True. True. What's the problem? We've forgotten about their little brains. Because we've waited now another two years starving this kid's brain of oxygen until he's seven. And then he might say, you know what, I can't really do an expander until you're eight, let's wait another 12 months, wait until a few teeth come through or whatever. Well now it's another 12 months of oxygen starvation and bed wetting and ADHD and everything else. What we do understand is once you re-establish that airway, and we'll see this in the adolescent growth spurt when the sex hormones kick in, because when sex hormones kick in, lymphoid tissue shrinks, we get catch-up growth. And we get catch-up growth when we have an adenotonsillectomy. And we'll often get catch-up growth when we have maxillary expansion. But what we don't get is we don't get the neurocognitive catch-up. We've lost it. And we've only got one bite at the apple. Can I speak to that? Yeah. So we published some work research looking at um, kids' uh, mental cognitive skills pre and post the medical selectomy and shown a significant improvement in those kids who were snoring, not necessarily even fully up near uh, post the medical selectomy. And the problem is, and you're quite right about this, is when you get behind in school, it's really hard not to stay behind. And the older you get, the bigger the gap. Because there are critical things that you're meant to be learning at a particular point in, in your school age. Yeah. So again, if you can help a child um, catch up faster and earlier or younger, that's going to have an effect probably on their entire life. Yeah. But when you think about getting into university and getting into qualification, you guys, if you were held back, might not have ended up as dentist or dental hygienist or whatever. So this is a very significant yeah. uh, consequence. That's a good point. Now with adults, Again, I just want my three things. I want my dental complications. There might be TMD this time. Um, I'm using my Epworth score. If I've got an Epworth more than 15, look, I don't read too much into an Epworth score. Sometimes in kids, so you know, I use what's called as a Bruni classification. Uh, B-R-U-N-I. There's lots of different classifications, though. Uh, again, it's just a tool. It's a screener. Uh, but if I go to high Epworth, you know, some people think, oh, you know, an Epworth at 16 is, is uh, consistent with someone falling asleep at a wheel. Oh, yeah, might be the case. Uh, but I get a high Epworth, I get the dental complications and the breakdown with bruxism, and then I've got a medical profile suggestive of sleep disordered breathing. Then, this time around, the first thing I'll do is I want my bloods. I want a blood test here. I want to rule out any internal bleeding. I want to rule out any low iron, folate or B12. People aren't going to tell you they've got a bad haemorrhoid. People aren't going to tell you that they have had blood in their stools for 12 months. But they need to understand the connection. Stomach cancer is not something to play with. Bowel cancer is not something to play with. And it will manifest in dental problems with patients. We're trained just to fill the holes and make a splint. Right? Then we say, oh, OK, we've had the blood test. We're all OK. Now, where do I go? Do I go to the sleep doctor or do I go to the ear, nose and throat doctor? Well, you know what? I'm not a doctor. You're the doctor. You've got higher marks than me. You're the doctor. What are you going to do, doctor? Well, the problem is the doctors don't know. They know less than us. You know now a lot more than the majority of GPs in Perth. The biggest problem we have is the GPs because they go, ah, that's rubbish. You just need a good night's sleep. Here, take this. See you later. <coughs> so this is where we need to be thinking outside the square. So in my referral, I say, right, I would like a sleep assessment. And then if it demonstrates any 
significant level of obstructive sleep apnea, I would also like them to see an ear, nose and throat doctor with expertise in that area. Because the sleep study diagnoses the condition, it diagnoses the sleep disorder, whatever one of those 80 it is. But it does not diagnose, it does not, sorry, it does not determine the site of obstruction if we have obstructive sleep apnea. That can only be determined through clinical assessment with a nose endoscopy. You've got to have the ear, nose and throat on board. So what are the dilemmas we see? We see the patients with apnea, they're whacked on CPAP, they can't stand it because we're blowing wind at a brick wall. So then they have to have higher pressures because the sleep doctor says it's the gold standard, it treats all level of sleep apnea. Well sure it does, at 5,000 miles an hour breeze and wind coming out all over the place. Well why don't we make it easier for this patient, clean out their carburetor, so now they can have a smaller mask, they can have a lower pressure, compliance goes through the roof or better still, they don't need any of it and they don't even need like even an oral appliance. You've got to ensure nasal patency before we really want to maximise outcomes with conservative therapy. So important note, uh, it carries a lot of mortality and morbidity. And sleep studies provide the diagnosis but not identify sites of obstruction and we need, to know, we need to maximise nasal patency. There is no pharmacological therapy for OSA. We can't take a tablet for it. Uh, again, the kids, I've touched on this here, uh, but really we understand that lymphoid tissue diminishes with onset of adolescent growth spurt, uh, but the patient can remain irreversibly, physiologically and neurocognitively impaired for the rest of their life, simply because you weren't doing your job. And now you're aware of this, you've got to start doing it. All right, that's the bad thing about coming tonight. Um, this is why I believe we should have ENT assessment before peak adenotonsillar hypertrophy at seven. So if I've got any concerns with uh, a kid, man, the sooner they're off to a paediatric ear, nose and throat doctor, the better. All right, let them make the call. If they reckon there's no problems, hey, I've done my job. All right? Um, and we understand that appropriate treatment when young can reduce the potential for impairment and or OSA in adulthood. Which ENT pediatric? Okay, there's a couple of good ones in Perth. Perth ENT Centre have got some beauties. There's Professor VJ, he's, he's got a, a name a mile long, but they all swear about him. Uh, I use Tim Cooney. Um, I find Tim Cooney's good. Uh, I use uh, a guy called Desmond Wee occasionally. Um, adults, I mainly use Richard Lewis. I sometimes use Desmond Wee. You know, the problem too with some of these guys, if they're not focused, what I've learned is an ENT is not an ENT. Uh, just like, you know, dentists are dentists, we're not dentists, we all have our little areas of interest. So just because you're an ear, nose and throat doctor, it doesn't mean you're going to be switched on about uh, uh, looking up their nose when a patient comes in with itchy ears. Because the itchy ears are usually irritation from clenching and they, they look in there and say, oh mate, you're fine, see you later. Oh, forget about the ears, see ya. And so you've got to stipulate, we want to be scoped, right? You want, to, you want to stipulate. So with adults, don't jump into a splint. I used to do this routinely, just don't jump into a splint. We don't make maxillary appliances if we can possibly avoid them. So if we're comfortable that we're not going to be compromising airway and we're not over, overlooking anything at a medical level, then yes, we can make night guards to protect teeth. You make them, I make them, but I make them for the lower jaw, not the top. All right? Less impact on tongue position. Okay? Um, and... Uh, like I said, the high risk groups, they usually complain that the splints hurt their teeth, they take them out in their sleep, or they just can't tolerate them. So finishing up with some case reviews here, and this is really uh, about 10 minutes and I'm done. So these are interesting. So this is a patient here, 54 year old male, who's referred to me by a specialist orthodontist, one of the kings in Perth. There's not many of them that like me, but this bloke sent a patient to me. And he said, Tim, could you please sort out the decay downstairs? The bloke's primary concern is movement of his lower incisors over the last few years. So this bloke's, you know, a bit concerned about his image, but I'm thinking, well, why is his teeth moving? Why has he got decay? Has anyone bothered to think about that? Oh, Tim also has got pretty bad, bad plaque control and he's going to have to have cleaning every three months while I stick braces on his teeth. So anyway, I looked at his medical history. This guy was diagnosed with severe OSA in 2010 and he didn't have any treatment. Why? Because he didn't tell his wife. He told no one. 
He also had post-traumatic stress disorder. He was a train driver and he ran over a bloke and killed him. Um, he was high as a kite on antidepressants and antipsychotics. He had a grade four melon patty. Um, he had a sleep, sleep score of 16. He was a fitness fanatic. So here I got a bloke with a block carburetor and he's trying to take his mind off this uh, train crash by working out the gym 500 hours a day. <laughs> he's just making his condition worse. He's a heart attack ready to happen, right? He's starving his poor heart of all this oxygen, let alone his brain. So we get him off for a sleep study. He had a lab-based sleep study first because the doctor said, yeah, OSA. He came in with an AHI of 31 and, a, and an oxygen drop of 68. So how do we go with him? We stabilised his molar. I whacked him on a, on a splint, a lower neutral gelb splint, which has a little less bulk, and we got him onto CPAP straight away because it was going to take a bit of time. This bloke hated CPAP, didn't want it, thought, OK, went and had some surgery. Had the surgery, uh, straightened up the nose, cleaned out the turbinates, UP3 where they trim the palate, and uh, tongue-based RFA is what they call radiofrequency ablation where they shrink the tongue. It'll come back, but they shrink it. He had a review home-based sleep study, and now he's 15, and his oxygen's climbed, and now he's using CPAP and he reckons it's the best thing he's ever had. He's got a small smart, uh, uh, mark, mask, low pressure. He wears his night guard and never done anything more. And does he want orthodontic treatment? Hell no. So I've been successful in talking people out of treatment. That's why I'm busy. Very different to the way we are marketed and educated these days. I talk people out of treatment. Uh, this one here, 68 year old molar, referred to me from a bloke in Broome. Uh, take out this lower molar downstairs on the left, Tim, it's buggered and this bloke's got some bleeding problem and I'm not going to do it up here. Well, okay. So um, I thought, you know what? I, I don't think I'm going to do this either. I did his medical history and the red flag here, he's been suffering from impotence for 15 years. He had a broken nose when he was a kid. He's been on testosterone for 15 years. He had net worth of 15. So what did I do? Well, I didn't send him off to have his tooth out sent him straight off for a sleep study. But here we had a lab base. Why? More medical comorbidities. He came in with an AH, AHI of 88. Um, sorry, that, yes, AHI of 88. That bloke should be dead. 30 is severe. This is a truck driver who drives racehorses from Broome to Perth to Esperance and back all year long. How would you like to come across him on the highway? So what do we do? Well, we, uh, we did co-treatment here. We're getting him managed at a medical level and we're managing him dentally because he's getting pain with these problems. So these teeth were removed in a controlled setting. Absolutely. They were done by an oral surgeon, not in the chair, for Christ's sake. Uh, we got him straight onto CPAP. He had to have that for his licence. He had no choice. Whacked him on a splint to reduce any further breakdown, a lower neutral gulp to reduce load. And what are we going to do with him? We're going to send him off to an ear, nose and throat and have a review if he's struggling with CPAP. This one here, there's a total of seven cases. Number three was a male, came in with a busted upper right lateral, lateral incisor, just snapped off. That was his main concern. Uh, did his medical history. Again, tonsillectomy, bit of a red flag, less than 10 years of age. Yeah, I'll snore a bit in the wife, you know, she's been complaining a little bit. And I do have a bit of anemia from time to time. He did have hemorrhoids. Why do we get hemorrhoids? High blood pressure. Now we know why. Uh, you know, he's on all these medications. So I thought, you know what, and he's a real gagger. And you only gag because you don't want people in there. That's the mouth breather. So I said, hey, look, let's get you off for a sleep study. He had a low Epworth, by the way. He came in with an AHI of 31, and his oxygen dropped to 55. And no one, no one has told him about this before. He's even a doctor hasn't. The doctor's just been prescribing him this stuff up here for years. This guy lucky is lucky he wakes up. So what do we do? He's straight onto CPAP. He loves it. It's turned him around. He's got this little reader on his machine and now his AHI is down to three. And now he's not gagging and he doesn't mind me working in his mouth. And then I'll just tidy up those teeth and keep it real simple and I might make a splint and buy some time. Next one here is a woman. Now this is an interesting one. Came in with her top first molars busted and broken. She hates the dentist with a passion. Hates the dentist. Gagger, sensitive teeth. Big clencher. I've had her on a splint for about 10 years and not really knowing why. So when I learnt all of this, I updated my medical history with her. And it just so happens that she has to sleep in a different room to her husband. It's been causing some pressures. 
It just so happens that she's also had chronic viral complaints. So she gets vaginal herpes, real bad. And she's just buried her mother, who suffered with dementia for 20 years. And I had sown the seed with this lady about 12 months earlier that we really should hear the sleep study. She's gone online, she's Googled upper airway resistance and she's looked at dementia and she goes, holy shit, this could be me. So I send her off to an ear, nose and throat doctor because she wasn't complaining of snoring and she wasn't gasping for air in her sleep. She was just, uh, uh, sorry, she was complaining of snoring but she wasn't gasping for air and she didn't have a high sleep score. So oh, I'll just send you off to an ear, nose and throat. I can refer direct for that. So uh, anyway, the good doctor had a look at her. Yeah, I'll do a home based study and it came in at 28 and her auction was out. He goes, ah, oh, that can't be right. Here, yeah, we'll do it in the hospital, more accurate. And it came back and it was double, four weeks apart. She's straight on to CPAP. Now, the interesting thing with this lady, I've only seen her recently, but the first time in 15 years she's not taking isoclavir. It's all stopped. The body's getting a bit more oxygen, the virus has got nowhere to hide. A badly broken down top molar. Yeah, doc, pull it out, make it quick, don't let me see anything. And mate, my breath is like the back of a cow. And we get the bad breath because of acid. Look at his medical history. He too has been suffering from impotence for a long time, but he hasn't been medicated. He only had a net worth of three. His body mass was on a little bit on the higher side. Went off for a home-based sleep study and he came in at 42 and an oxygen dropped to 79. He's straight on to CPAP. He reckons his sex life has improved 100% within the space of six months. Right? So what I'm going to do, I just got rid of the little tooth and I put him on a splint to protect his teeth and I buy some time. I'm not doing anything else. Keep it simple with these patients. Don't make it more complicated. This one comes in, presenting concern. Oh, little Johnny, his, he's still got a couple of baby teeth and he's eight years of age and they shouldn't be there. And sure enough, we can see this uh, supernumerary, you know, just sitting up here, right? So any one of us would say, right, off, have your teeth out, see you later. Fixed on that medical history. I do my medical history and look what comes out of that, bed wetting. This poor little bugger hasn't had a sleepover. He can't be a boy scout because of bed wetting. And his mother is highly protective of him. So it also comes out that he's been on Ditropan for about three years. I sent him home with a Bruni score and he came home severe for OSA. So I thought, right, off you go. Sent him off to the paediatric and he had a low, uh, you know, he was tiny. This kid wasn't growing. Sent him off, had the teeth out. We did that straight off. Then I sent him off to the ear, nose and throat doctor and he had his pipes cleaned out. Within 12 months, all medical conditions had resolved. He was now a boy scout, which he was never able to be. And he's no longer medicated and his BMI was normal. I'll never get rid of those people. You'll never ever get rid of them. Last one, right side of jaw ache. This is a beauty. Came to me with a loose upper lateral incisor, recurring failure in tooth loss. She's come to me because she has seen one of the best, in my opinion, prosthodontists in Perth. She was referred to him by her previous GDP um, to have assessment for implants because the teeth are all failing, they're all loose and I'd like to have my teeth out and have implants please. So she goes off to the specialist, the specialist gives her a bill for about 50 grand and she walks out going, you know what, maybe a plate might not be so bad. So then she seeks me out because I treat her daughter and I look at that and she had a shocking bite on her. She had generalised periodontal involvement. A lot of the bottom teeth had been lost in the last 10 years. So I look at her medical history here. She had a long history of sinus surgery. This wasn't even picked up by the specialist. She snores. She's had a history of ovarian cysts. Ovarian cyst patients are bleeders. They're the anemia patients. They will often get bleeding. Okay, be it internal, through your bowels, depending where the cysts are. And like with fibroids, fibroids are a bit the same, right? Um, she nocturia, she's going to the toilet, you know, 15 times a night. She likes the odd drop of alcohol. Um, had a moderate sleep score, BMI through the roof. 
sent her off. She had an AHI of 53.8 and she wasn't even on a back. Why? I reckon if she was on a back, she'd be dead. And she was treatment planned by the hoodoo guru, prosthodontist, for 50 grand of implants. Give me a break. Who are we treating here? Are we treating our pockets or are we treating a patient? You know, you put money aside. Your job is to treat a patient. And you need to look at teeth first, then medical. So what are we doing for this patient? She's straight on CPAP. Uh, she'll have ear, ear, nose and throat assessment if she can't comply with CPAP and she'll probably progress to a, a partial upper immediate. Uh, we might just try and hang on some teeth for as long as we can. I'm going to try and hold off a full upper denture for as long as I can. Why? Because if they mouth breathe, they've got no saliva, they're all dry and it's a bloody nightmare. All right? So in summary, you know, I sent Mark off to his doctor to see an ear, nose, have a sleep study and, and the doctor said, oh yeah, what would a dentist know? Well, I challenge that doctor because I reckon I know a shitload more than that doctor does when it comes to this. They should be listening to us. Right? But what I've learned is GPs know less about more. Right? Specialists know more about less. But what you guys need to become is what I call as an oral physician. And that is you're halfway between a GP and a specialist. You've got to have a very wide viewpoint, you've got to have a very open mind, and you've got to do a lot of reading. All right? A lot of reading. So the take home messages are you don't stop at the tonsils. Nostrils first, then the mouth. You recognise sleep bruxism clinically and radiographically. And in particular medical conditions that predispose towards nocturnal mouth breathing. You recognise teeth as the canary in the coal mine. You respect airway and tongue at all times. And you appreciate that the difficult patients are usually the ones who can't breathe through their nose. Now, unfortunately, in dentistry, what I've witnessed over 26 years is we're often measured by what we do as opposed to what we don't do. And I think that's pretty sad. In my experience, de definitely less is best. And the smart ones aren't sheep. Don't just follow the blokes in front of you. Just because they're doing implants and everything else doesn't mean you have to. And uh, yeah, occasionally, you know, bruxism is useful. We can hold cotton wool rolls, but we also appreciate that it's homostatically vital. Without it, we'd be dead. And the books, this book here on the, this one here, ah, oh look, it's a very long-winded text. It's about 500 pages and about 40 pages are guts. And I, I, I personally probably wouldn't recommend that text. It's the first text that's ever come out on bruxism. It's been out for a couple of years, but I wouldn't recommend it. The text that you need to commit to is this one here. And it's a very, very good text. All right? And you need to buy that and you need to study it and it becomes a Bible. And it has some very, very good chapters in it. It won't have a lot of the stuff that I've talked about, but it will at least... Um, cement a lot of the stuff that I've talked about tonight. So I know I've covered a lot of stuff. It is a very, very complicated area. And unfortunately, I might be speaking out of my backside here, but you're not going to get this off too many other people. And I think it's because we're often lectured to and taught by specialists. And they're only interested in their little field. And you miss out on everything else. So. I take my hat off to Dr Nagestu uh, for providing this forum because it's only through these forums that you do get that exposure. It's a forum for GPs to air their wares. And um, uh, yeah, so thank you Alex for the invitation and uh, that's all I've got to say. <laughs>